Well, welcome students. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about nutrients and how they cycle through ecosystems. So clearly the first question we need to ask is what actually is a nutrient? And so if we go to any source on the web, we can find um, a pretty simple answer. Even if we look at Wikipedia, they'll tell us things like a uh, nutrient is a substance that provides nourishment and essential um, for growth and survival. Maybe it's an organic nutrient. So it consists of things like carbohydrates or fats or proteins, um, vitamins, any of those kinds of things. Um, and so we know that we need to have nutrients to be able to survive and be able to do what we do as a living organism. And so if we kind of go back to what we learned in macromolecules, we can kind of remember the kind of consistent pieces for each of those um, biomolecules. And specifically, if we look at a periodic table, we can kind of remember back and say, well, every single one of those four macromolecules, if we looked at nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, they all had hydrogen and oxygen and carbon. Every single one of them did. And so we clearly know that those are important nutrients to be able to have. But in addition, there are these other pieces like nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur that was also present in some, but not all, of those biomolecules. And so we know that those are also going to be important ones to remember and consider and kind of take a look at. So as living organisms, we need all of these pieces, and they're mostly available in our natural environment. And so we have to be able to get these things in different ways. And so before we talk a little bit about the cycling of each of these individual nutrients, I wanted to introduce some terms. So specifically, we want to talk about pools, and we want to contrast that to fluxes. And so pools are simply a location where nutrients are stored. And so you can have large volumes, or in some cases, small volumes. They can really vary depending upon the nutrients you actually have. And then if we want to be able to move those nutrients, transfer them from one pool to another, we do that through this process called a flux. And of course, fluxes can be biological processes, or they can be physical or chemical processes. And we'll distinguish those as we go. And so first, we're going to start out by looking at one example, and that's looking at water. And water is nice because it kind of takes up two of those nutrients. It looks at hydrogen as well as oxygen. So let's look at some, some places on how we could do that. And so if we then look at the pools of water, we can clearly see that there are um, several of them, and they really vary in terms of their size. So clearly the largest of those pools is, uh, is in the oceans down here. That's where we have most of the water. The next largest is in ice, and then the next largest is in groundwater. If we look at all the pools that are labeled here, actually the smallest one is in the atmosphere. So although it is fairly small, it's not as though it's actually not important. It is clearly a very important pool of water. Um, but those are the kind of main primary pools that we have, kind of where they, they actually occur. But in many cases, to kind of move them from pool to pool, we have several different fluxes. And so the water cycle actually has lots and lots of different ways to move water from pool to pool. So one way to do that is through this process of evaporation. You can actually have evaporation off of surfaces of water or off of land. Um, and that actually takes it from these um, uh, water that's stored into the atmosphere. And then you can, of course, get it out of the atmosphere through precipitation. That may fall on some land surface, flow over the surface, and go back into the water. Or in some cases, it may actually infiltrate into the soil, percolate down into the groundwater, and that then flows out into the oceans as well. In some cases, you may actually be able to have plants take up that water from the soil, um, and then they can actually release it through the process of transpiration. And transpiration is a little different from evaporation because it only happens in plants, because we learned a little bit about in photosynthesis, plants have those little teeny tiny kind of holes in the surface of their leaves and sometimes other places on their, on their bodies where they're actually able to control whether they open or close those little surfaces called the stomata. And so that can actually control how much water is actually transpired into the atmosphere or if it's retained into the organism itself. And so clearly there's lots and lots of different ways to cycle or to, to flux water between each of the, the different pools that we talk about. So now we're going to shift and talk about those individual, the other remaining nutrients, that is carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And so we'll talk about those individually. So let's first start out with carbon. So we can kind of bulk or kind of put all of the pools into kind of these four main categories. 
So we first have the atmosphere, we have oceans, and of course included in oceans are things like rivers and lakes, I just don't list them here. Um, we also have organisms, and then finally we have rocks, which often includes soil as well as a major component of that particular pool. And so as we think a little bit about um, what comprises these pools, it's important for us to go back to some of the lessons we've already had. So first we can think about a little bit about those macromolecules that we talked about several weeks ago. And so we know that the macromolecules include carbohydrates, they include lipids, they include nucle nucleic acids, and of course proteins. And clearly all of those things are going to be present in organisms, because we know that they're these biological molecules. And carbon, as you can see, is clearly present in each of those different pieces. Okay. In addition, we can take some of those, um, maybe actual organisms, they start to degrade, and they're actually present in the soil, and as well, it's not indicated here, but they can also be present in the oceans as well. Each of those um, kind of different forms of carbon as each of these different biological molecules. And then we can kind of think about, well, what other forms of carbon are there? Well, another form of carbon is a gaseous form as carbon dioxide, or CO2. And so clearly we know that the atmospheric component of carbon primarily is carbon dioxide. But it actually can readily exchange with the ocean, and you can actually have dissolved carbon dioxide in the oceans themselves. If we then go to kind of rank these different pools of carbon, depending upon their relative sizes, we can see some interesting patterns. First, the largest pool, which may not be what you expect, is actually in terms of rocks. Because we know that carbonate rocks um, comprise a big part of the kind of crust of um, the planet Earth, and so that's where a lot of it is. In addition, you can find other types of rocks or fossil fuels that are also carbon-based, and so that is the largest of the pools. The next largest is oceans. Um, as I mentioned, there's lots and lots of dissolved carbon dioxide um, that either can be at the surface, or in some cases you may have um, plant material or other biological material that dies and then floats down to the bottom of kind of the deep ocean environments, and that can also be another source of carbon. The next largest pool is organisms, so that includes us, um, and there's lots and lots of different forms, as you can see, of carbon to be in those different organisms, which then leaves us with the um, final and smallest pool of carbon, which actually is in the atmosphere. And again, just like in water, although it's the smallest pool, it is certainly a very, very important pool, as we'll talk a little bit about in the future. So that's carbon. So as we talk a little bit about carbon and how it fluxes, there's different ways that we can actually understand how carbon moves from pool to pool. So first we can kind of think back to a lot of the things we've already learned in this class. We already know that you can actually take atmospheric carbon dioxide and plants can take that into their own biological um, body through the process of photosynthesis. And then of course you could have another organism that could come along and actually eat some of that plant through the process of consumption. They can actually move some of the carbon from one organism into another. We also know a little bit about the process of cellular respiration, which essentially says that you can have biological organisms that are breaking down carbon molecules and releasing part of them as um, gaseous form of CO2, which can either go into the atmosphere if you're a terrestrial organism or into the um, water or the aquatic environment if you are an aquatic organism. Um, another thing you could do is you could actually combust things. So if you take maybe this forest of trees and you light them on fire, you could have a forest fire. And of course what happens is it burns this material and it releases it as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, you can do the same thing um, in factories or in your cars or any other way if you actually use fossil fuels. And those are actually um, ignited, they're combusted, and they release um, a gaseous form of carbon as carbon dioxide. Um, also, you could actually have um, organic material which starts to degrade but doesn't entirely degrade because um, sediment actually goes ahead and starts to kind of bury it and kind of puts more and more um, of the sediment on top of it. There's lots of pressure, lots of heat, compacts it, and it actually kind of squishes it, if you will, into um, some forms of fossil fuels or some forms of rock. And then finally, the last flux, of course, we already mentioned, was fluxing um, of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the ocean, which happens fairly readily to equilibrate those two pools in many cases. And so that's the carbon cycle. So next we're going to move on and talk a little bit, um, or before we do that, let's kind of talk about what kinds of 
um, processes these are. And so first, before we do that, we kind of think of all of these six different fluxes and we say well, which ones are biological processes, which ones um, are these physical or chemical processes. So the top three are biological processes. You need organisms to be able to do photosynthesis, consumption, or cellular respiration. Whereas the final three, of course, are these physical or chemical processes which don't need biological organisms. So next we have the nitrogen cycle. And so nitrogen is, is another one of our important nutrients. And so as you can see here, we have the same kind of categories or, or large classifications of the pools of this particular nutrient. We have the atmospheric component, the oceanic component, which of course includes lakes and rivers, and we have organisms, and then we have rocks, which um, usually also includes soil. And so we can think a little bit about the forms of nitrogen in each of these different pools. So we already talked a little bit about um, in our class the fact that um, nitrogen is the largest component of our atmosphere here on Earth. That is about 80% um, of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas or N2. But in addition, we also know there's other forms of nitrogen, um, gaseous forms of nitrogen like NOx or N2O that are present um, in the atmosphere as well. Um, we can also think a little bit about the macromolecules that we already talked about and recognize first and foremost that this is a nucleic acid and of course this is a protein and we know that both of those components actually contain nitrogen. And so clearly any place that you actually have a biological organism you also have nitrogen. So clearly organisms as well as oceans which can house some of these organisms sometimes they die, start to decay and end up in the oceans um, oftentimes in lower deep portions. Um, we can also think a little bit about what happens in the soil because there's many different forms of nitrogen actually in the soil as well. And so we can have all different forms. We can have ammonium, ammonia, we can have nitrate and nitrate, and all of these are just different forms of nitrogen um, that are present in soils. And so these are the different pools of nitrogen. So then we can kind of understand how these pools of nitrogen move from pool to pool through um, an understanding of their fluxes. And so this, the nitrogen cycle tends to get fairly complicated, um, so don't be panicked by it. Um, but this is just a kind of general summary on how some of these things work. And so we could start out, of course, with having nitrogen housed in an organism. And if it goes through the process of ammonification, essentially that's breaking it down. And it breaks it down into some of these other different forms, primarily things like ammonia. And then you can actually have nitrification, which actually changes these forms of nitrogen into other different forms. Denitrification is taking these nitrates and actually being able to convert them into this gaseous form of nitrogen, kind of gets them back into the atmospheric component. Nitrogen fixation is a very, very important process which um, biological organisms can contribute to. There's in many cases bacteria that often live in the soil and can actually convert atmospheric nitrogen into some of these other usable forms that we often consider or kind of remember them related to soil forms of nitrogen. But another wonderful way to actually fix, fix nitrogen is through lightning and that is kind of a um, natural way that, that nitrogen fixation can happen without any biological organis organisms contributing. Um, clearly you can also have things like plants that can uptake some nitrogen from the soil when it's actually available in forms that they can actually be able to use like most of these forms. Plants cannot uptake atmospheric components of nitrogen. And of course if an organism comes along and eats some of these components that's a direct way through consumption to move from organism to organism. In addition, if you have all of these components actually in the soil and you have water that comes along into the soil, you can actually leach these components out, which makes them travel to other different ecosystems. And just like we saw with carbon, you can actually um, have sedimentation and compaction, which can then convert these things into kind of more rock forms of nitrogen. If we again kind of take all these different fluxes and categorize by what those which are biological processes from those which are um, chemical and physical processes, we can see that we do have a very, very large component which are classified as biological processes. So you need in many cases nitrogen um, conversion that happens through um, some enzymes that are housed by lots of different kinds of bacteria um, that can actually happen. That's what happens in the first three different types.
But of course, we do have other processes that can occur um, through physical or um, chemical processes as well. And I, sh I should also mention that, of course, nitrogen fixation can occur through biological processes, but it also can occur through natural processes through lightning, as I already mentioned. And so that's the nitrogen cycle. So the phosphorus cycle then, um, interestingly, has um, one notable pool that's lacking from what we've actually already seen in carbon and in nitrogen, and that is that we don't have an atmospheric component. So the cool thing about phosphorus is the fact that there is no gaseous form of phosphorus. So if there's no gaseous form of it, then it simply doesn't occur in the atmosphere. The only way to get phosphorus into the atmosphere is to have little teeny tiny particles that then get ingrained or, or entrained in, in air currents and are able to kind of float around. But they're essentially just like dirt in the air, so it's not really um, an atmospheric, a true atmospheric component. So in essence, all of the phosphorus is either in the oceans, lakes and rivers, in organisms, or rocks and soil. Okay, there is no atmospheric component. And if we look at all these different pools, the really kind of simplified version is that the main form in all of these is as phosphate. They're just different sources, and in some cases attached to other different molecules or, or other different elements, but they're all as phosphate. And as we kind of look about and understand where they occur, in many cases you can actually have dissolved phosphates in aquatic sources, and those things can actually precipitate out, and that's what becomes our rocks. And we can actually mine those in many cases to be able to use some of those phosphates for our own purposes. And clearly we know that phosphorus is also another key component of some of the um, biological molecules that are so important as we talk about nucleic acids and things like ATP. All of those things have phosphorus in them, and so we clearly need them. So if we then understand kind of how phosphorus moves from pool to pool, we can clearly understand some of the fluxes. So first and foremost, we can kind of understand that if we do have some of this phosphorus that's actually in the soil, that it could be actually taken up by a plant and used by the plant to be able to grow and do what it needs to do. And then maybe an organism comes along and eats that plant. And through consumption, they're actually able to move their phosphorus from one pool to another, even though they're both organisms. Um, another thing that could actually happen is we could actually have um, um, rocks that actually house a whole bunch of phosphorus, which is actually one of the largest pools, and that actually erodes and it kind of weathers these things out but through the erosion or weathering process, um, contributes more of these phosphorus um, components into the soil. And then in some cases those can actually precipitate out, especially if they're dissolved in water, they precipitate out into this kind of layer in these marine sediments, which are then kind of um, uh, covered over with sediment and compacted, and they then will become rock again. And one of the only other way to kind of get them out is to kind of upheave them through um, geological processes. And so if we kind of take all these processes and kind of rate them by biological versus physical and chemical processes, you can see that only the top two are things that biological organisms are actually contributing to. And it's the kind of latter components. All of these kind of remaining four items are things that are chemical um, or physical processes. And so then finally what I wanted us to do is just to compare the different um, pools of each of these three different um, nutrients to kind of understand which ones are the biggest pools, which ones are the smallest, and, and kind of how they measure up to each other. And so the one key thing you should hopefully recognize is that in every one of these nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, that rock is indeed the very largest pool. Clearly there's a lot of rock on Earth and there's a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in those rocks. If we just focus in on carbon, we can see that the next largest pool is in the ocean. There's lots and lots of carbon in the ocean, whether it's dissolved as CO2 or it's as in one other of the other forms we've discussed. The next largest pool, the third largest, is organisms of carbon. And then finally, the final and smallest pool of carbon is in the atmosphere. This is a little different than we see what happens in nitrogen. Again, we see that rock is the largest, but as we said, the atmosphere component, 80% of the atmosphere on Earth, is actually nitrogen, nitrogen gas. And so that's actually the second largest um, pool of nitrogen. Then comes oceans, and then finally organisms last. 
And of course, we already mentioned that phosphorus is, is definitely a little bit different because the, there is no atmospheric component, which is why we only see three main components here. Rock is by far and away the largest component of phosphorus, followed by oceans, which is most of those dissolved um, phosphates, and then finally organisms. And so that's kind of a good comparison trying to understand where each of these nutrients are and how they get from pool to pool so that we can kind of understand a little bit of where each of these nutrients are so we have this understanding of how organisms use each of these nutrients.